Last week, I said I was going to start making an electric motorcycle. Well, I've started and I've made some good progress. These are some spaces that I've designed and made, but we'll get to these a little bit later. I think the best place to start is what and how is a lithium ion battery pack made? This is a lithium ion cell. It's very similar to the ones they use in electric cars like Tesla's and it's just a 3.7 volt, slightly larger AA battery. But to demonstrate how a battery works, I'm gonna substitute the cell out for a can of beer. So if you get multiple cells, lay them in series, this is when the positive is touching this negative of the next cell, the voltages will add up. So we get 3.7 volts times three, which will equal 11.1 volts. Now every cell also has an amp hour rating. This is basically the density of the battery and how much electricity it can hold. These cells are five amp hour, which means it can produce five amps for an hour. Now, if you connect all the batteries in parallel, this is when you connect the same terminal, all of the positives together, you will get a sum of all of those amp hours from the batteries. So these three cells connected in parallel with five amp hours each will equal a 15 amp hour battery pack. Now you can combine both parallel and series connections into a battery pack. So if I get two lots of three cells in parallel, combine those two together in series, we will get a 7.4 volt with 15 amp hour battery pack. Alternatively, if you connect two in parallel and three of those sets in series, we will get 11.1 volts with a 10 amp hour capacity. And it's really as simple as that. The complexity comes in when you try and make that pack reliable, but most importantly, safe. So we know that I want a 72 volt battery. That means I need 20 of those batteries in series to get to me that voltage. The other thing is I know the capacity I want, which is around 3.6, 3.7 kilowatts. So with a five amp hour cell, I need 10 of them in parallel to get to me the battery capacity. So my battery pack needs to be 20 along by 10 deep. And that's where these come in. These are cell spacers. So basically each one of these cells will snap into the spacer and you can get to each side of the positive and negative and you can connect correctly all of the batteries in the order you're looking for, either in parallel or in series. This is the bottom and this is the top. These spaces have been 3D printed as a prototype. I had a theory that I wanted to test out. Each cell usually is placed into the rack and then spot welded directly together with this metal strip. It's actually nickel. The problem is, is if you have any issues at all in the battery, they will just completely discharge all of their current. There's nothing to stop it happening. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to put a fuse between each cell. So if there's any damage in the cell or any issues with them at all, the fuse will blow and it will isolate that cell, making the battery far more safe. I've designed in this cell package a fused link system. I don't know if it's going to work, so that's something I'm going to do today. Instead of the nickel plate being directly mounted to each top of the cell, it is going to run inside these channels. Then the battery will be next to it and we will spot weld a fuse link between the cell and the nickel strip. This means every single cell will be individually fused. So today I need to test the amp draw and the currents of different fuse wires and the nickel strip. And the big worry when these cells fail, it can either be from say the cells punctured or uh, there's an internal fault in the cell so it dissipates all its current very quickly, is they uh, can do something called thermal runaway, which is very dangerous because this cell can either explode or catch on fire, which you definitely don't want.
actually trying to do here? I'm going to make a 12 volt circuit with some H7 bulbs in that circuit. I can then get the 15 amp draw that I need to uh, basically replicate what a cell is going to discharge at its max output. So when I'm doing that, I can test a couple of different nickel strips I've got to make sure they don't get hot at 15 amps. Also, I can test some fuse wire, different sizes and thicknesses, and I can test it which one won't get hot at 15 amp and also will break as soon after it discharges for the most efficient fusing. So to do that, I'm gonna use this, which is an oscilloscope. If anyone doesn't know what that is, it is basically a multimeter that will just plot it on a graph. So it's nice and easy to read. I'm gonna use an amp clamp so I can see what amps the circuit is drawing. Also a voltmeter to see if I get any volt drop within the circuit. And also, I borrowed a FLIR thermal imaging camera so I can see if each material is getting hot after sustained current draw. Okay, so I've got this sketchy little setup. Three bulbs in parallel. Uh, I've got an amp clamp fitted on to my laptop and also a voltmeter. You can see the volts is 12 volts from the battery and the blue line is the amps. If I show you the computer and touch this on the terminal, you'll see what happens to the amp draw. So that was the largest nickel strip that I've got and that held 12 amps for over two minutes and it didn't increase the temperature by even a single degree so that is more than efficient to carry 12 amps. Next up I'll try something a bit thinner. Next up is fuse wire. This should blow when it hits 15 amp continuous, so we'll give it a try. I was uh, surprised about that actually. I thought the wire would get hot at around 12 amps continuous after a few minutes purely because it's supposed to blow at 15, but it didn't increase in temperature at all, which is excellent. So now we need to know or find out when this wire will blow. So we need to add the bulbs into the circuit until we increase those amps and then the circuit blows. Number six. So that has been running for two minutes and the fuse wire is only starting to get warm and that's pulling nearly or just over 24 amps which is nine amps more than it should blow at. It should blow at 15. So this means I need to go back to the drawing board, find out what is going on here and see if I can get some different wires to test and just go through all this process again. But I'm so glad I did it because it would not have been wise to have run a bit of 15 amp fuse wire that doesn't blow until it's had, who knows what, 30, 40 amps put on it? Good. As soon as I stopped recording that piece, look what happened. It finally, finally blew. And because we were recording it on here, I can work out exactly how long it took to blow. So let's have a look. So that took three minutes and 10 seconds until the fuse wire broke at 24 amps, which is really good information to know. Next up, I need to look up what the actual batteries can handle at a safe load before causing internal fault and failure. Uh, but that's the next week's job. See you then. <laughs>